long years of research. Yeah? And especially intelligence tests are designed in a way that you can really tell from the overall test score how good you are. So, just a question to you. If, if you have uh, intelligence, uh, IQ, intelligence quotient of 115, is that good or bad? Hmm? Not very good? 115. Oh, what do you have? Higher. Higher. But uh, I suppose it's more or less average. Because 70 would be retarded as far as I know. So 70 is retarded? I think so. I think I read it somewhere, but I don't check. It's okay. What is average? Well, that's. A, yeah. Yeah. If you measure the intelligence of all people, <laughs> the average would be hundred. Intelligence tests, the classical one, are designed in a way that the average uh, score is one hundred. Yeah, like you can see on this picture here. So you see here a normal curve. So if you test all the people in the world, at least a random sample, you will find this curve, average will be 100. This is how tests are designed. Yeah. Um, so you all know what a mean is on average. So what is a standard deviation? Oh my God, statistics. What is a standard deviation? If you think about standard deviation, you remember a uh, statistic course, right? And you remember that? QBA. Oh, QBA. <laughs> standard deviation, that's the, that's the weighted average difference between the mean and the actual value divided. Oh, my God. No, it's very, very simple standard deviation. Don't forget about the formula. In this particular case, the standard deviation is 15. This is how tests are designed in that case. 15. Now, what does that mean? Very simple, as a rule of thumb. If you take the, the if, you, if you look at a range from mean 100, minus 15, 85 to plus 15, yeah, the mean plus one standard deviation. You have a range from 85 to 115. And within this range, you'll find two thirds of the population. Right? That's the meaning of standard deviation. The standard deviation tells you. How, 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 how the different measures are spread across the mean, right? If they spread it very broadly, yeah, then standard deviation is high. If they are much very narrow, close to the mean, the standard deviation is rather low, right? Okay? If you do a student's party, the standard deviation of the age is low. If you do a marriage, the standard deviation of the age is big because they are children, the grandma, grandpa. Okay. So, this is how tests are designed. So, I want you really to take home that um, intelligence tests, once you hear that somebody has intelligence of, let's say, 115, you easily, can easily tell that. How many people are better than 115? Hmm? One, six. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sixteen point something percent. Okay. So that means 115 is quite good. Let me add one type of test which is not so commonly used, uh, but you should have heard about this yeah, because they exist and they are, they are very important also in the psychological sphere. 
uh, projective tests. They are kind of powerful, uh, but you need, really need to be a professional to use this. Um, there is a long tradition in a psychology about how to measure motivation. How can you measure motivation? Yeah? And think about this. Motiv we believe that motivation is there and people differ with regards to their motivation. But can you measure this? Hmm. I can measure abilities because I just give people a task. I can measure personality, I just ask questions. But about motivation, and uh, the most dominant method to measure motivation and what is important to a person is done by this projective test. So, this is an example, a so-called thematic or perception test, T-A-T. When you do this test, you're shown some pictures like this. Very different pictures on cards. Look at this picture. And now your task is, please tell the story around this picture. Spontaneously. Right? And uh, if you tell a story about this picture, really spontaneously, and you are all able to do this, the question is, what comes up in your story? Yeah? So, is this picture about a conflict? Is this about friendship? Is this picture about power? Is it about family? Is it about is the one your boss and the other the employee? Yeah, or vice versa? Is this the the father and the son, is this the father, uh, the, 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 the son, and the father-in-law? Who? What is, what is this picture all about? And the idea is that what is important to you, your, your way of how you perceive the world is projected into this picture. And the funny thing is really, if you show people very different pictures, really totally different picture, and by the way, the last picture, the last picture of this test, is an empty card. There's nothing on it and you have to tell the story. Yeah? If you do this, you will find out that all the different stories you tell, all the ten stories, they all have something in common. Yeah? Well, I did this by myself with a psychologist. I was really amazed about the result. You know, all my stories were traumatic. <laughs> they started slowly, became very traumatic, very positive. And they all ended up with a nightmare. <laughs> I don't know why. I learned this. I, I don't know what this tells me. But, uh, it was interesting to see that, really, there is a kind of red line in every story. Yeah. The right one uh, is ink pattern test, Rorschach test. It's just ink pattern. The question again is, what do you see in this picture? And the, this, this is more from uh, psychoanalytics. Yeah? So it's, it's rather weird, but... Yeah. It's a projective test. The idea is, of what you, is this a demon or what is that? So you, you inspire people to talk about what they see and what comes to your mind. And from what they tell, you draw a conclusion about their personality. Again, this is not so heavily used in practice, but you should have seen these because when we talk about tests, uh, these are quite relevant. So let me add, related to tests, let me add some points um, around one specific field. For example, when you apply at companies like Lufthansa, if you apply at Accenture, this big consulting firm, if you will apply at PricewaterhouseCooper and you pass the first step, if you pass the pre-selection stage, you get an invitation via email to do an online test. Dear John, thanks for your application. Looks good. Now, we would like to learn more about you. Please follow this link to the online test and uh, do this test by end of next week. <clears throat> you click on it and you get some tasks. Right? Tasks like this on the right hand side. So, I mean, this is great. And there are a lot of advantages. Uh, um, I don't have to tell you about these advantages in more detail. I mean, it's clear. Uh, I, all, everything which is online is globally accessible. 
uh, not in North Korea, but in the rest of the world. Uh, low operation costs. I mean, it costs nearly nothing just to operate an online test. You just send the link, the person does the test. The results are analyzed, calculated automatically. Yeah? Um, even more, you can, you, can, you can track the response time, whatever you, whatever, whatever you, 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 you can tell from this. Yeah? Does somebody answer the, the task very fastly or slowly? Whatever that means. Yeah? But you can do this. Yeah? The second point, I'm going to explain in a minute. That, to me, the most important point. But there are some disadvantages. Yeah. If you are invited to do an online test, you are invited by Accenture, please do this test. How can Accenture really be sure that you were the one answering the questions? It might be that you think, ooh, this is about intelligence. It would be better my brother is doing this. <laughs> I don't know. The, as a company, you never know in which situation somebody is doing this test. Do you do this test somewhere in a, in a internet cafe, or why do you do this? In which mode? Yeah. In a drunken state, or what? Yeah. I think you have no control about the setting. Yeah. Okay. But let me get back to this uh, point of opportunity for adaptive item presentation because this is the most critical thing about online tests. Um, for this, I need a chalk. Different items, like the one we have seen with the, uh, with the intelligence tests. Different items, as you have seen with the intelligence test, uh, uh, are different with, the, with, with regards to the difficulty. Yeah? There are easy tasks and there are very difficult tasks. Right? So, we can measure the difficulty of different items. There are items which are really simple. 100% of people are able to answer the question or fulfill the task correctly. For instance, one, two, three, <laughs> everybody is able to do this task uh, correctly. And on the opposite, there are items which are unsolvable. Nobody will solve this task. Nobody. Maybe zero point zero 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 one percent in the world. Now, you have items which are very simple, and there are items which are unsolvable. When you start online. Yeah. When you start an intelligence test online, mm -hmm. would you start with a very easy task and then stepwise you increase difficulty? Or where would you start? Would you start this way? Yeah. Yes? No, you won't. Mm -hmm. You would do this on a paper pencil test. Yeah? Stepwise increase difficulty. No, in an online test you have the opportunity to start somewhere in the middle. So you know there is a task that can be fulfilled by 50% of the population. You have measured this. You know the difficulty of this item is 50%. Now, there is a person who is doing this task, the first task, and the person is good. Yeah? Found the right answer. What's the difficulty of the next item? Hmm? More difficult, I would say. More difficult. Yeah. How difficult? I don't know, maybe 25% right. more. Here. So you step to this one. And um, the person did not well. What's the difficulty of the next item? Now you go back. Here. In the middle. Which is uh, 
right? <laughs> okay, the third one. Oh, it did well. <laughs> you might use only four items and you got to the point. You right? that's, that's the advantage of online tests or any tests which are administered electronically. Adaptive item presentation means that the presentation of the next item depends on whether you did right or wrong on the previous item. That means adaptive. Yeah, the test adapts to your response. That's really powerful, right? Because you very few items you come to the point. Okay? That's the biggest advantage. Okay, of course there are uh, some more advantages of tests that I shown as I show in the uh, in the next slide. Um, it's really objective. You cannot influence the person which you measure. You can compare the candidates very easily. Uh, the cost is limited. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, you can use different tests, combine them in different selection measures, as we have seen. Right? Uh, you don't need much infrastructure. They are easy to use, yeah, especially when you do it online technically. You just need internet. You know, or you just need a laptop or something like this. You can use these online. I mean, you can't. You, you can do interviews also online. We're going to talk about this. You can do interviews via Skype or so, and com some companies do this. But still, there are people who must communicate with a test. It's very efficient in that sense. Yeah, and the analysis is always very, very simple. They are standardized processes to calculate the. This the result, the overall score. Okay? Okay, so uh, now we are in the middle of the chapter candidate selection, and as you all know, there is one method which is about interviews. So everybody knows what an interview is, uh, but there is a difference between a professional interview or a non so professional interview. So let's have a look at a typical interview, how it's done well. So on this slide here, you can see a very typical structure of an interview. Um, and here you see on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, you see time. On the other axis, you see the tension. What tension? The tension of the candidate. When you enter an interview, you are nervous, so there is some tension. Okay, now let's look how this tension changes over the course of an interview. So at the beginning, tension is probably high. You are very uncertain. You don't know what will happen in the next one or two or so hours. So uh, the very first question in every interview, the very first question in the interview is what? It is, did you find the way well? How are you? Things like this. So it's very, very informal. It's kind of... It's an approach to say, well, let's have a little small talk, let's get close to each other. Uh, the idea is just to reduce the tension, okay? So that you, as a candidate, you feel comfortable. You feel, yes, this is a situation where I can open myself and I can talk about myself. So, the next step always is that, or it should be, that the company presents itself. So it's about the job, it's about the company, um, so you can lay back a little bit and you just can listen. Maybe ask me some questions or so. But it's the company's turn. And they present you the job in question and the company and what the company does and the products and all these things. But then, after a while, it's your turn. And in this phase, it's your chance to present yourself. Uh, later on, we're going to talk about what the most important questions are. But at this point, you can just take on that, it's about you, it's about why are you here, it's about what are your strengths, where are you good at, how would you solve certain problems, and things like this. Okay, we'll talk about these questions in a minute. Then after this, uh, you get the chance to address some open questions, or the company will address some open questions to you. But at this point already, it's close to the end of the interview. And then at the end you talk about 
the next step. So this is a very typical structure of interview, of a personal interview. Um, what are the questions? I mean, there are hundreds of books out there around what are the typical questions in interviews. There are some uh, career advisors telling you what are the questions um, I must expect in any kind of interview. And when we summarize the different types of questions, uh, then, then it's at least about five. It's about five questions and you can see those on the right hand sides, on the employer column. Uh, these are the questions typically addressed by an employer. Uh, why are you here? This is about your motivation. Why are you interested in this particular job? What can you do for us? So, what going to be your contribution to the success of the company, to the department, to the team, to the product, or whatever? Okay? What kind of person are you? Uh, this is very much about your personality. Do you really fit into the social environment of the company? Into the social environment of the team? When I was a recruiter at SAP, I always asked myself, will the other people in the team like this person? So it's very much about you as a person, about your personality and how you fit into the social environment. And then, of course, what is special about you? What distinguishes you from others who have the same skills? Yeah? What are the unique strengths which you can show? This might be the ultimate, the ultimate argument related to, uh, related to you, why the employer should go for you. Okay? And then, last but not least, can we afford you? Think about people which are really ambitious, are really talented, have demonstrated a strong career path in their past, people really have strong expectations about their future career. Um, and now think about this particular candidate applying for, let's say, a small company in the midst of that forest. This company will ask itself, can we afford this guy? Yeah. Can we really pay the salary this person expects? Can we really meet the expectation of this person? Can we afford this person? But this is only half of the story. In a professional interview, it's not only about the employer's questions. It's not only that the employer wants to know a lot of things about you. In a professional interview, it's also about the candidate's questions. And on the left side of this slide, you will find the typical questions a candidate must be able to address in any kind of interview. So let's have a look at these. Why am I invited? I mean, it's not that you would ask this question in that way, but in a professional interview, the employer should tell the candidate, why have we invited you? Yeah? Why, what, what do we think is special about you? Or at least you as a candidate, you, you would like to know, okay, why did you invite me? Is there anything in my CV which, which really catched your interest? What can your company offer me? I mean, what I always tell to companies is that nowadays, in the midst of the talent shortage, it's not only that the candidate must convince the employer, it's not only that the employer at the end makes a choice, whether to hire this guy or the other guy, it's also about the candidate. The candidate today, a talented, qualified candidate today, has options. And the candidate will ask himself, why should I go for this company and for, and not for, for, for another company? Okay, so what can you offer me? Not only in terms of salary, but also maybe in terms of what kind of tasks I will be responsible for, how about international tasks, how about work-life balance and all these different things. Right? What kind of employer are you? Why the employer might ask himself, himself about your personality. You as a candidate, you will ask yourself about what kind of culture will I find in this company? What is important to the people in this company? 
Yeah? Do I fit to this culture? What distinguishes your company from others? What is special about this particular company? Or can I afford working at your company? I mean, you must think that most of the professors in our faculty, they had management positions before they took this role, this job, uh, and they earned way more than what they earn today. Even for myself, to me it was clear that once I take over this professorship, I will earn less than before. So the question is, can I afford working for this company? Am I willing to pay this price? Or am I willing to travel one hour every day to work? So all these things which are similar to, for, to the employer perspective can be afforded you. I ask myself, can I afford working at your company? So, the most important message on this slide is there are questions from both sides. And in a professional interview, both sides must be, uh, must be able to answer their questions. Now, let's have a look into more concrete questions. I showed you that these questions are only very generic, but in practice, no company will ask this way. But what are the typical questions in an interview? Let's have a look. So, on this slide you will find some very, I would not say typical examples, but uh, the type of questions are kind of typical. Don't expect the exact wording uh, in one of your interviews, but, but the type of questions uh, is very, very typical. Let me pick out one of these, uh, planning, the, third, the second one. This question is about planning. It's about your planning skills, about your competency in planning. So the question is, describe a time when things didn't turn out as you had planned. What did you do to analyze the situation and how did you address the issue? Now, I think every student should be able to reflect on his or her past I mean, all of you have experienced situations like this. So the question now is, how did you deal with such a situation? You see, with such a question, an employer really wants to, wants to, to go very concrete, really want to see how you behave in certain situations. Okay? So these are just some, some examples on, on, on this slide. You can read through the others. Uh, sometimes it could happen that you experience so-called Puzzle questions. You know, puzzle questions. I give you a very typical example. Um, a typical example is um, how many times does a human being use the word and in a day? Again, how many times does a human being use the word and in a day? What is the right answer? Is the right answer to say, hmm, I don't know? No, probably not. If you say, I don't know, 100? Yeah, that's even worse. What is the right answer to this question? Um, I must think, once a company asks this particular question, or a question like this, the company wants to see whether you have the skills, the competencies, to answer a question like this, a problem like this, in a very analytical way. So, you would respond, Oh, interesting question. I don't know, but uh, let's see. Um, a human being is talking, let's say, four hours a day. And in an hour, uh, in, 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 in an hour, in, in a minute, uh, a person uses, let's say, 10 sentences. So we have 600 sentences in, in an hour. Uh, 600 times 4 is 2,400. Now let's say in every second sentence we use the word end, then it's 1,200. The correct answer is 1,200. At the end, nobody cares about whether this number is correct or not. It's your way how you deal with problems. Different question, very typical question which is typically addressed to business graduates. 
Um, what is the daily revenue of H uh, and M store in Stuttgart? Of course, nobody in this room does really know the correct answer, but you should be able to calculate this, right? Okay, so this is about interview. Um, once you are invited to an interview, you probably are invited to multiple interviews, not only one. And if companies do that right, when they combine interviews, they do it in a very structured way, as you can see on this slide. Uh, if you are invited to, let's say, four different interviews, it could happen that in every interview, different aspects are covered. Maybe. In the first interview, which uh, in this example is done by an HR person, uh, it is about motivation, uh, mobility. Why are you interested in this job? What drives you? you know, are you hungry enough for doing this job successfully? Uh, but also maybe about mobility. Are you willing to spend two, three, four days in the week uh, in a different uh, city, far away from home, are you willing to travel, uh, things like this. While in the second interview, which might be done by the manager, by the prospective manager, it's about team ability, yeah? your ability to work in teams and about your leadership skills. While in the third interview, which is done by a technical expert, it is very much about your technical skills. And in the fourth one, uh, you might do a panel interview, not only with one single interviewer, but with a group of interviewers, uh, maybe your prospective team. Okay, and there, again, it's about different aspects, like maybe team ability and leadership. Okay? So, that's about interviews. Uh, let's talk about our last method, which is very important, and you should have a really good understanding about this method. It's the assessment center. Okay, what is an assessment center? Probably some of you already have attended something like this. Um, if you have attended an assessment center, you have probably experienced that in an entire day or maybe in two days where you spent in such an assessment center, you were together with multiple candidates. You were not alone. It's, it's, not a, it's not an individual method. It's not about one single person. It's about multiple candidates, maybe 6 to 15. You were all together an entire day. And um, there are some assessors. You know? Well-trained people, psychologists or managers, who are trained to observe you over the course of the one or two days. Okay? And in this assessment center, it's not only about, let's say, team ability, it's not only about your communication skills, it's not only about your intelligence, it's not only about your mobility, it's about multiple criteria. So assessment centers are there to, to draw a complete picture about you, about multiple aspects about you multiple criteria. And there is not only one method used in an assessment center, it's not only that you, you do one single test, uh, there is only an interview or a group exercise, there are multiple methods. Multiple methods which are used, interviews, tests, exercises, and all this stuff. And you do these in different situations. During the course of the day, during the course of the two days, you do very different exercises. Okay? So, what is the most important term when we define assessment centers? It's multiple. It's that you do not rely only on one single interviewer or observer or assessor. You rely on multiple. You do not rely only on one method, a test or so. You rely on multiple methods. You do not rely only on one single criterion, you rely on multiple criteria. Multiple, multiple, multiple. That's the idea of an assessment center. Now, let's have a closer look how, how this works. 
On this picture, you find a very typical assessment center setting. Okay, so in this setting, you find the different participants or the candidates. And let's simply assume that these candidates, these participants, they do an exercise, a group exercise. They discuss something about a given topic. And then you see the assessors. And in an assessment center, always it's very, very clear which assessor is observing whom in that particular situation. This is very clearly defined up front advanced to the assessment center. So a very typical attribute of assessment centers is that assessment centers are very clearly structured and defined with regards to everything. Okay? Um, now we also have a facilitator, a moderator. This person guides through the entire assessment center. Okay? Now, what are the typical exercises which we have in those assessment centers? Um, I have sorted the different exercises into uh, such a kind of portfolio. Um, we have exercises which are rather standardized. Yeah, it's a very standardized situation, very controlled. And we have situations which are much more dynamic, open, okay? unstructured. Okay. On the other uh, dimension, we have uh, exercises which are more on an individual basis, and exercises that happen individually, and we have other exercises which are done in groups. So the group exercises much more allow to observe social skills, like communication, teamwork, and these things. So, whenever you are invited to an assessment center, the assessment center will start probably with one typical exercise, which is an individual one, in a very dynamic way, which is the introduction. Yeah? You might be asked to introduce yourself in three minutes. Okay? So you are invited to come into the room, yeah? sequential, one after another. And you stand in front of the assessors, maybe also the others in front of the others, and you have two or three minutes time to present yourself. And you can use flip charts and everything. Okay? Uh, this is a very typical exercise. And as you know, as you might think, in such an exercise, you can, you can do a lot of things right, and you can do a lot of things so, um, do you really speak out loud? Is your presentation well structured? Um, is your pronunciation clear? Is, do you keep eye contact? All these things. So there are only two or three minutes, but the assessors, be sure about it, will observe a lot of different criteria. Okay? Then here, the intro test. Now, the intro test is a classic the classic method in assessment center. Just assume um, you're back from holiday. You come into your office and um, you have a bunch of emails, documents, and you have 20 minutes time to deal with these mails and documents because of 20 minutes you have to leave your office because you have to go to the airport or do something. Okay. So, this is a very clearly structured exercise where you get these fake, fake emails. And what you have to do now in these 20 minutes is you have to read through the material, you have to prioritize, you have to be able to distinguish between what is important, what not, what to do, you have to use a schedule and everything. So, the idea is with such an intray test, post call people in German, with such an intray test, you can really see whether people are structured, whether people are able to, to organize their lives, their work. Okay? Then, of 
course, uh, in some assessment centers, uh, psychometric tests are used. These are the typical tests which you already have discussed, like personality tests or, or intelligence tests, things like this. Okay? Now, let's go to the uh, right hand top side. We have, um, for instance, role play, in a very dynamic version. Um, let's um, assume a very classic one, maybe a little bit a silly one. Um, imagine you fly with a balloon, right, in a group of four. And the balloon is filled with helium. And the balloon is losing gas. So the situation is that in order that three people will survive, one single person has to jump. Okay? So um, you must discuss in this group who will jump. That's, that's kind of silly, but you know, yeah. You can do a lot of things wrong in this case, of course. Do a lot of things right, as always in those exercises. Um, it would be wrong if you would respond in a way saying, well, you know what? I jump. I simply jump. That would kill the exercise. Okay? Um, it would not be a good idea either if you would say, you know what? We can discuss over hours. I will never jump. I will not jump at all. What would be expected in such a situation? It would be expected that you listen to the arguments of the others, that you can relate your own arguments to those of the others, that you are able to follow the discussion, maybe that you also can take over some leadership, encourage others to bring up their arguments, uh, reflect on different perspectives and so on and play an active role in such a situation in order to find a common solution. Okay. You can do this role play without dedicated roles or you can do this role play with dedicated roles. That would mean that maybe you are a doctor, you are a lawyer, you are an engineer and you are a priest and all these arguments. So the one who is an engineer might say, well, I'm an engineer, and maybe I can fix the problem. And I can avoid that. There is the second person who will jump. Somebody else would say, oh, I'm a priest, I can pray for this, and I have more power in doing this. Uh, I have a shoulder line to our uh, boss. So. Okay? so these arguments can be brought up. Um, in some Assessment centers, as you can see on the middle, uh, in this slide on the top, meet employees in some assessment centers. You can meet actual employees. You can talk about the, the, the reality, the, 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 the work, the, the culture, and all these things. It's, it's that you get a little bit closer to the employer. You get a better understanding about the employer as such. This is a new idea, but it's more and more done. Okay? You all know what a business simulation is. You, you do it in a, in a specific course with a computer. You do some business scenarios. You have to make decisions. You have to draw information. Uh, so in such a simulation, uh, you also can do a lot of things well and some other things wrong. Group problem solving. You get a bunch of paper and tape and you simply have to build a tower. Okay? So, you see there's a huge variety of different exercises. Okay? Um, I'm sometimes asked, also by students, um, Hello, Mr. Trost, Professor Trost, um, I'm invited to an assessment center. Uh, do you have a tip for me? A special hint. How should I prepare myself? And my recommendation to you is you should be informed about what's going to happen in such an assessment center. Yeah. As, as, as today, I've shown you some exercises. So, so you should know what, what will happen, what is that, what is an assessment center, of course. But the two main recommendations are, first, go to bed early, yeah, sleep well, 
the night before because such an assessment center is really exhausting. It's very intense, so so be in good shape. Okay? My second recommendation is be who you are. Really be who you are. Um, you will not make it to to be somebody else in an entire day. So I mean the assessors are not dumb and they will realize whether you really are how you behave. Uh, you can tell it immediately. Really. Um, in my career I've experienced some assessment centers and um, you know there are these typical um, assessment center trained candidates and they try to behave in a very specific way. They want to they want to meet the expectations of the assessor, which by nature is fine, but normally they do it in a very extreme way. So, so I remember the first exercise, the introduction, the typical trained candidate comes in says, Hello, I'm burned. Um, now, I will present myself to you. I have structure. structure my presentation into three steps my childhood my youth my time as a student yeah. using the flip chart media usage yeah. uh, if somebody acts in this very extreme way that's well you think as an assessor oh man this guy really sucks um, or think about this this um, this exercise about exercise about the paper and the tape where the crew has to build a tower. Um, don't show too extreme leadership skills. Uh, if, you, if you start an exercise in a way that you say, okay, what is your idea, what is your idea, what is your idea? Yeah, and you try to guide these people, you will immediately feel that the others feel that, oh, this person really is in pain. So be who you are. And don't 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 act in a way as you think it's expected from you. Okay. Um, whenever assessment centers are done, there is uh, architecture behind. It's just like this. It's a matrix, and uh, as I said right at the beginning, in every assessment center, different criteria are measured. For instance, leadership. Communication, intelligence, mobility, intercultural sensitivity, organization. And then we have different exercises, like the introduction, the group exercise, the intro, the intelligence test, and a personal interview. And as you can see in this matrix, different exercises address different criteria. Okay? So this is how assessment centers are built, typically it's not told to the candidates which exercise is used for which criteria. I think the company should do so, should be very open and tell the people, okay, now this is about leadership and here's the exercise. Okay? So, that's about assessment center. One last thing. Um, for every exercise, for every, every exercise, there is a kind of a judgment scheme. Always. I told you about the introduction exercise right at the beginning. And uh, you must really see that for every assessor, they have this kind of scheme in front of them where they really can put points related to your performance. So, and all these schemes are collected at the end of the assessment center and then there's a kind of, we call it, assessment center conference where the assessors, together with the facilitators, get together and talk these points through. You have scores for different exercises about different criteria for different candidates and they talk this through and from there they make a kind of ranking. Who was the best overall? Who was the second one? And so on. Okay? So it's very, very structured. So, the good thing about assessment center is it's really valid. We talk about it later, we later talk about what that means. Valid, it's reliable, it's objective. Um, 
you can really uh, compare the different candidates. Once you have 15 people in the room, you can better tell who was the best, who was the worst, than having all these people in an individual setting. Okay? Um, assessment centers are designed in a way that the criteria which are measured, measured they reflect the future duties and responsibilities. So, I told you some criteria at the beginning. Leadership, communication, mobility. Um, a company does not choose these criteria by chance. They make sense. And there is a kind of job analysis behind it. So, the companies know what they expect from their future employees. So, uh, what is done in those exercises should reflect the responsibility related to the jobs which need to be filled. You can't act in a way uh, which is, we call it, social desirable. It's not that you can be somebody else through the entire course of the day. So, this is the fourth point on this slide, limited risk of social desirable behavior. Uh, if you spend one entire day with a person, um, you will get to know this person. And this person cannot be an actor through the entire day. Okay? So you get a real, a real understanding about a person. You really can experience a person in multiple settings. You can get a real, a real impression of, of a participant in, a set, in an assessment center. High transparency of requirements in the eye of the participants depends on the assessment center, but, but as a candidate, I get a feeling about what is important and what is not important. The exercises really show me um, about what the company takes care of. Okay? These are advantages. There is one big disadvantage of assessment, of assessment center, and this is simply the cost. Now, I told you right at the beginning of this, of this chapter that at the beginning of the recruiting process, companies just look at the resume you know, for 11 seconds maybe. Yeah? And this does not cost a lot. Right at the end, when only a few of the candidates still are in play, they use very expensive methods. But these are also more reliable, more objective, and more valid. Okay. Um, there are good methods to select candidates and there are bad methods. There are cheap ones, there are expensive ones. We learned that just looking at a resume is very cheap, doing an assessment center is very expensive. Uh, and there are some methods in between, tests, interviews, blah, blah, blah. You can assume that these different methods, they differ with regards to their quality. Mm -hmm. There are good ones, there are bad ones. With some you really can predict the future performance, with some others you hardly can do this. Yeah. So, when we talk about quality in this particular context, we do not use the term quality, really. We use the term validity, reliability, or objectivity. I really want you to understand these concepts. They are really key whenever we talk about candidate selection. Okay? Uh, by the way, you can read about this criteria in almost every HR textbook. I would like to explain the different criteria and how we can use these. Before I do so, I must explain some stats, some statistics. Um, and there is one statistic which we named Correlation. Okay? In short, R. Yeah? So, what is a correlation? You all know this? A correlation is the linear relationship between two different variables. Um, what does that mean? Let's have the relation between two different variables. Any ideas? OK. 
Okay. Let's have um, money and happiness. Okay? So the idea is our students which have more money are they happier than those with less money? We all have some ideas, we have our private theories, our naive understanding about this, but now let's do science. Yeah, let's do a study. Uh, we, we could do this in this room, by the way, but well, I, I don't want to do this. Uh, otherwise, I would need to ask you how much money do you have and how happy are you? But let's assume we ask somebody who has really a lot of money available every month for free spending. And this person really is happy. We assume that we have a test for measuring happiness. Okay? We have a person that has less money available here, and indeed, it's less happy. We have another person somewhere in the middle, and also such happy. Uh, we do this 50 times, and we get a cloud of dots like this. All right? Let's just assume this. So the shape of the cloud is like this. The question now is, is there a relation between money and happiness or not? As we can see from this result, is it's a, it's a yes and no. It's, it's not a clear yes, but it's also not a no. Um, in statistics, we want to have a clear number. We want to have a really clear number telling us, is there a relationship? between two variables or not. Okay? Now, question. If the relationship between money and happiness would be absolutely perfect, yeah, there would be really a direct relation between these two variables, how would this cloud look like? Yes, it would be a line. You could really say, the more money you have, the more happier you are, full stop. If this would be the case, the correlation would be what? One. Right. If there would be no relation at all, how would this cloud look like? Yes, would be kind of... Yeah, the dots would be spread around the middle somehow. No direction, nothing, uh, no, no relation at all. Yeah. Just, just a randomized cloud of dots. If this would be the case, correlation would be, yes, zero. Okay? In practice, we hardly get a, a correlation of one, whatever you measure you hardly get a correlation of one. More often you get a correlation of zero, but in most cases it's somewhere in between, or I must be more correct, it would be between minus one and plus one. If you, if you would find a, correla uh, a, 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 a relation like this, a perfect negative relationship, yeah, would we would have correlation of Minus one. So correlation always is between minus one or plus one, telling us how the linear relation between two variables uh, concretely is. Okay, that's correlation. You might ask me, how can we calculate this? Um, of course, there's a formula, but it's... Um, I, I can't tell you, I couldn't tell you the formula by heart. And, and um, don't tell the statistic professor, but in my eyes, in your future, you must not really understand how to calculate this, but, but you must be able to interpret a correlation. So whenever you hear about the correlation, uh, from now on in your future, and you hear the correlation between job satisfaction and turnover is 0.21, 0.21, you 
You say, okay, it's close to zero, there is something, but it's not a perfect relationship, okay? You must be able to interpret the correlation, okay? So, coming from there, we can talk about validity, reliability, and objectivity. We need the correlation really to, uh, to, to estimate these different criteria, okay? What is validity? Validity is whether a method really measures what it is supposed to measure. To give you an example, we have intelligence tests, but do the intelligence tests really measure intelligence or maybe something else? Does a personality test really measure personality and not something else? Okay, does the method really measure what it is supposed to measure? That's validity, Gültigkeit. <clears throat> now, uh, how is this done in practice? Um, I just mentioned the intelligence tests. Now, in science, how is the validity of intelligence tests really measured? Um, on one side, you measure the intelligence of different people, right? So you have smart people, rather dumb people, higher or lower IQs, right? So, and what we typically do in science is we compare the test scores, yeah, where a person really rank on this scale, with an external criteria. Okay, and the typical criteria are school grades. The idea is, if a test really measures intelligence, and we assume that the more intelligent the, per intelligent the person is, the better he or she is in school, then there should be a relationship between the test score on an intelligence test and the school grades. Okay, and, and this is typically measured. Uh, what we can tell is that for intelligence tests which are really good, validity is quite high. Now, we all know that uh, success in school does not only depend on intelligence. We know this. But what we really believe in a test that measures intelligence, that is supposed to measure intelligence, and the results do not show any relation to school grades, if we would have a test like this, would we believe in this test? Probably not. So, this is how to prove it. Okay? Um, I give you another example. Now let's assume we have a, let's call it, um, sales capability test. Sales capability. Now this is very practical. We want to hire salespeople, right? And uh, we really want to tell during the recruiting process Will this person here succeed if we hire this person as a sales representative? Okay, so we use a sales capability test. Okay. Now, if you want to know whether this test really measures sales capability or something else, we must compare the test scores with the criteria. And what, what could the criteria be in this case? Yes, revenue. Those who score high on a sales capability test should sell more. And those who are weak on a sales capability test, huh? well, here, they should sell less. And we would expect that there is kind of relationship like this kind. Okay? 
if there is no relationship at all uh, between sales capability test score and the actual revenue, we would not believe in this test. Okay? So this is how validity is really measured. We use correlation methods to compare test scores with a criteria. Okay? That's about validity. Does the test really measure what it is supposed to measure? Now, let's talk about a, uh, the second criterion, which is reliability. That's the second one. What is reliability? In German, Genauigkeit. Yeah? We know that uh, whenever you use any kind of tools to measure something, watch, the scale, or something else, they can differ with regards to their reliability. Okay? Now let's think about a scale. Waage. Okay? Now let's assume um, I have a scale right here, and, and I... I step on the scale, 81. I get back from the scale, and I step on it again, 83. Huh? Then I step again on it, 82. Okay, okay let's take the 81. Um, if you would get results like this, it always differ, while I assume that my weight in this particular minute did not really change, you would say, this scale is not reliable. But does this scale really measure my weight? Yes, of course, it measures weight, but not in a very reliable way. So there is one method which we use to determine the reliability, and this is the so-called test retest reliability. It's very easy. We measure one time, we measure the second time, and, if, and we measure different people, doesn't matter on what, on weight, on, on size, on intelligence, on sales capability. Yeah? If the test, whatever we measure, is reliable, we would expect that we get the same results when we test again. So there's one person which we test one time and we, we, we measure the person the second time. There is one person, person which we measure the first time and we measure it the second time. Yeah? And if the test is really perfectly reliable, yeah, the results will be the same. If the test is not reliable, we get something like this. And if the test is totally crabby, in terms of reliability, we get something like this. And what you can see here from this picture is, again, we use correlation methods to estimate the reliability of a test. Okay? Test, retest, reliability. Okay? So, that was the second one. Um, let me add one question to this. And if you really answer this question well, you really got it. Um, is it possible that a method is reliable but not valid? Reliable but not valid. Is there any idea? Okay. Yes, of course. There's. I have. I have. I have an example. I have an example. Um, let's say I measure intelligence by simply measure the size of your head. <laughs> can, I can do this? Yeah. I measure the size of your head yeah, to understand about your intelligence. Is it reliable? Yes, it's reliable because I can measure very, very reliably, very, very correctly the size of your head. But does that really measure intelligence? Probably not. So, yes, the test can be reliable, but not valid. That shows that between validity and reliability, there might be a huge difference. Okay? So, let's come to the third criterion, which is objectivity. 
So, at the end of your study here at Fort Wayne, you will have an oral exam. Okay, an oral exam. And in this exam, you will sit in front of two professors. Okay, and the two professors will they will uh, ask you about different business related things. The exam is about your business understanding. It is about your ability to really articulate business related ideas in a personal setting. Um, it's not that you uh, reproduce things which you have learned by heart. It's really a conversation. It's a, it's a, it's a discussion about things. And we as the professor, we tell whether you really have an understanding, if you are able to talk business. Okay? So, there are two professors. Now, let's assume I am one of them. And the other one is, uh, let's say, Professor Taylor. Okay? Now, here's the first student, and uh, we talk business, half an hour, blah, 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 and at the end I say, well, this student really did well, while my colleague says, no, this person really did bad. Second student, I say, oh, that was really lousy. while my colleague says, it was okay, the third one. I say, it was good. Professor Taylor says, mm, not so good, and so on. If we get results like this, what would be wrong? What we can see is that our judgments really differ. You know, here, while I judge the person who is really good, Professor Taylor says the opposite, the same here. If something like this happens, how can we explain something like this? How, how, how can it come that two people making a judgment about one the single person after having spoken to this person one in the same situation? How can it come that two persons have these totally two different judgments? <clears throat> How can this come? It can happen because the two different persons, they have different expectations. They have different perspectives on one and the same uh, person. They have a different reference frame, so to speak. They use different criteria while judging one and the same person. So whenever this happens, we can say that um, there is a lot of, we call it, subjectivity. The people here are really subjective, these two colleagues, these two professors. Yeah, they are subjective. They use their own frame of reference. So, 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 so that would mean that the result which we have here is not only about the students' capabilities, it's about the professors. It depends on the professors whether or not a student succeeds or not. Okay? So, whenever something like this happens, we would say it's lacking objectivity. Or, in other terms, if we both would always agree, then we would agree that the results, the grades, are very much about the person, the students in question, and not about the professors. Now, if you want to calculate whether or not uh, two different people come to the same conclusion, if you really want to measure objectivity, how can we do this? Again, guess what? We use the correlation analysis. We use the correlation analysis. Here is person number one, and here is person number two. And now, the first person is judged by this person, and by this person, okay. Same result. The second person, the second candidate is judged by this person on this level. 
and by this person on this level. Okay, same result. If this happens all the time, we have a perfect relationship. And they all both independently come to the same conclusion. If we have something like this, we have perfect objectivity. If we get something like this, the judgments, the two independent judgments of the different person um, do not relate to, 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 to each other. Uh, it's totally subjective. Okay, so and, and again, we can measure objectivity by comparing different judgments and using the correlation method. Okay, so that was it about candidate selection. We spoke about why is it important? Why do companies select candidates? Why? Because they want to reduce the recruiting risks. Yeah? Hiring the right person, rejecting the wrong person. Um, and to do so, we use certain methods. We learn that there is a resume, there is an uh, interview, there are tests, assessment centers, and a bunch of other methods. And we learn that it's very important to have these methods because there are some judgmental biases.